Have you ever wondered why there are so many different churches and practices and beliefs in the world today? Is it possible that every denomination is right? Does God approve of this kind of division and confusion? Does it even matter? That's what we're going to talk about today. Why are there so many different churches and does it matter to God? Is He pleased with the current situation in the religious world? In fact, if I were to ask you as we begin this lesson exactly how many different churches exist in the world today, what would you say? You'd probably say, I don't know, I guess there's a lot, and, and that would be right. There, there are a lot. In fact, I looked this up recently, and I found that there are approximately 43,000 different churches. 43,000. That's amazing. Now, think how confusing that can be to a person who is seeking the truth because you have one church over here who is teaching this practice and another church over here who is teaching just the opposite. And one church says that item A is sinful and another church says that item A is mandatory. Who's right? Can they both be right? And of course, some people will say, well, it's good to have variety. Just attend the church of your choice. They will say that one church is just as good as another. Anyway, we are all going to the same place. They're just different paths leading us to a, uh, a unified or the same location. You ever heard somebody say that? Dear friend, may I respectfully tell you that the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. When I read in my New Testament, I read about only one church. But when I look around me today and I see those who profess Christianity, I see thousands of churches. Now, the question is, how did we get from one to thousands? And the answer is, something went wrong. Something went severely wrong. But it didn't go wrong with God. It went wrong with man. Now, here's the first point that I want us to observe as we consider this subject together and it is this. In the Bible, we read about only one church. Now, you might say, well, that is so simple. That is so fundamental. But what we have to do before we answer the question, why are there so many churches, is we have to lay a foundation. We've got to cover some basics. And this is the first basic principle. In the Bible, we read about only one church. I want you to use your imagination with me for a moment and I want you to pretend that such a thing exists as a time machine. And I want you to imagine that we could get in this time machine and we could travel back to the first century, to the first Lord's Day on the day of Pentecost. And imagine on that day when all of these people were converted, 3,000 people were baptized and became the very first Christians. Imagine that you could walk up to one of them and ask the question, Sir, I would like to know what denomination did you just become a part of? What might he say? He'd probably say something like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not familiar with that term. Can you explain? And you say, I, I, I mean, what church did you become a part of? Was it the Methodist church? Was it the Catholic church? Was it the Baptist church? Which one was it? He would probably say, Sir, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of a denomination. I've never heard of these groups that you're discussing. All I know is I became a part of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, the church of Christ. And that would be exactly right because there was only one. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, that fits perfectly with what Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 when He promised, Upon this rock I will build my church. The Apostle Paul later echoes this sentiment of one church as he's speaking to the elders from Ephesus. He tells them to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. In the book of Ephesians, we're told that God has put all things under Christ's feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body. Now, I want you to pay special attention to this because the church of Christ and the body of Christ are the same thing. 
And so if I'm talking about the church and I'm talking about the body, they're the same. Now, that's important because when you get to Ephesians 4 and verse 4, the Bible says there is one body. Now, if the church and the body are the same and there's one body, then friends, there's only one church. When a person reads in the New Testament, he is impressed by the fact that there existed only one church. Well, what happens if someone comes along and they say, well, I would like to start a different division of that one church, a a different denomination of that one church. Would, Would that be okay? And the answer to that question is no. I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Corinth Church of Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That's important. That there be no divisions among you. That's important. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Notice that. Same thing. No divisions. Perfectly joined. Friends, How does that mesh with what we see in the religious world today with all the different denominations, all the different divisions and sects, and uh, how does that mesh? The answer is it doesn't mesh at all. It's completely foreign to the New Testament concept of the church. Now, more specifically, what was the problem at the Corinth Church of Christ? Listen again. Here's verse 12 as he continues. Paul says, Now this I say, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Then Paul says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? You see, within the first century church, you see the seeds of denominationalism. Because some people were starting to say, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Paul Christian. Other people were saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm a follower of Apollos. I'm a Christian, but I hold to to Cephas, that is Peter. And others were saying, well, you know, we hold to Christ. Division was starting to form, but Paul, by the Holy Spirit, condemns it. And he makes it clear, this is not of God. Okay, as we seek to answer the question, Why are there so many churches? I want us to notice that God predicted that there would be a departure from the New Testament pattern. Our first point, our first foundational principle is, in the Bible there's only one church. Our second point, our second foundational principle is, God predicted that people would not hold to the one church. They would depart from the New Testament pattern. Despite the clarity of the New Testament about the oneness of the church, despite the warnings against division, God knew divisions would come anyway. In fact, the Bible foretells several times about this. One of the warnings that we read about in the Bible that I was mentioning a moment ago relates to the conversation between Paul and the Ephesian elders. Paul tells them to shepherd the church which was purchased by the blood of Christ. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now listen to this part. Also from among yourselves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. It is interesting to me that Paul tells the elders, the leaders of the church, that a departure would come from within them. It would come from them. The reason this is interesting is because one of the first departures in the church historically was with regard to its leadership and its organization. Now, another warning about the departure that was to come is in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, let's read this together. 1 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly. In other words, the Holy Spirit is speaking very plainly here that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. 
Now, it is interesting. The Lord said there's going to be a departure from the faith, the one system of faith that God created. He said men are not going to hold to that. They're going to depart from that. And then he named some specific examples. He says that people are going to say you can't eat certain food. They're going to say that you can't marry. Well, we're going to see in history that these two specific departures, that is not eating food and not being allowed to marry, are going to be exactly what is going to take place. Now, thus far, we see that according to the New Testament pattern, there is only one church. We also see that God predicted there would be a departure from that one church New Testament pattern. Now, with that foundation laid, let's get to our key question. Why are there so many churches today? How did a basic Bible belief system with a unified group of people turn into literally 40-something thousand different denominations with different practices and beliefs? Well, history tells us that very early on, there arose splinter groups who had ideas and doctrines contrary to the first century church and contrary to the doctrine that they had received and practiced. Some of these groups were the Gnostics in 125 A.D., the Montanists, 156 A.D., the Manitians, 244, the Novatians, 251. But now one of the largest and most significant divisions that relates to the early church relates to its leadership, its eldership, and it involved a, a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. Now, from the beginning of the church, God's plan was to have elders and deacons. You can read about their qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. These elders were to have authority only over the local congregation where they were members. That's the way that God established it. Each congregation was to be autonomous, that is self-governing. One congregation could not have authority over another congregation. One eldership could not have authority over members in another congregation. But over time, elders began meeting together and discussing problems relating to their various congregations. And when you get to the 300s A.D., the Roman Emperor Constantine was starting to have interest in this growing group of people known as the Church of Christ. And so, in the year 313 A.D., he passed the Edict of Milan, which ended persecution against Christians. Now, you can imagine that gained him favor with Christians in and around Rome. And so, the Roman government began gaining a lot of influence with elders in the Church of Christ, but the end result had a very adverse effect on a large part of Christ's church. Because you see, this new relationship led to a meeting between elders in the Church of Christ and Roman officials. This meeting took place in 325 A.D. History calls this event the Council of Nicaea. This meeting gave rise to the first official departure from the original New Testament church. And so they created a, a new church. They created a new denomination. And it took on the Latin word Catholic, which is translated as universal. And it established a hierarchy that was very similar to that of the Roman government. What they did was they literally took the example of the Roman government and they built a, a church format based on that model. And so in this new church, there were men who were over several churches or groups of churches, which was a very clear departure from the New Testament pattern. But you see, Christians who were faithful to the Bible, those who stood against the newly created Catholic denomination, they were persecuted. They were ostracized. They had to meet in hiding. But the pure New Testament Church of Christ continued to exist. Now, historically speaking, after the formation and the establishment of the Catholic Church, it grew in strength and number and political power, and they continued to create new doctrines and man-made traditions, and they enjoyed the growing political endorsements from the Roman government. In time, 
their doctrines were made mandates and placed upon all the members of the Catholic Church. In fact, I want you to notice the dates of some of these Catholic doctrines and, and how they were implemented long after the formation of this denomination. Notice the Latin Mass. Notice the Purgatory. Notice the idea of the first official pope. They called him God on earth. Notice transubstantiation, the mandate of the celibacy of priests. It comes along in the year 1015. All of these things came long after the New Testament had closed. But if you look back at the timeline, I want you to see that for the first thousand years, there are really only two churches. You had the Church of Christ that began on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. It still existed. And then there is Catholicism that started later. Now, history tells us that in the year 1054, the Catholic Church split into two denominations. And so then you had Roman Catholicism and the Greek Orthodox Church. During this time, the Bible became more and more unavailable to the common man, and history enters a period that we call the Dark Ages, and the Catholic Church just continued to add man-made doctrines. Examples include indulgences in 1192, the confessional booth in 1215, sprinkling replaced immersion for baptism in 1311, and the Pope was declared infallible. Now, by the time you get to the 1500s, you will see a lot of activity on the timeline. You see all the different colors here. This is because there were men such as Martin Luther who began to stand up and say, this is not right. Martin Luther was a German monk, and he particularly hated the sale of indulgences. He hated the idea that a person could pay for sin in advance and be forgiven of their sin by paying money. He challenged the Pope by saying that the Bible is the only source of authority. Martin Luther's widespread opposition to the Catholic Church ignited what was known as a, a protest movement. Historically, it's called the Protestant Reformation. In the year 1521, another denomination appeared shortly before the Lutheran Church came on the scene. It was known as the Anabaptist. They started out as a protest against the Catholic Church and particularly its practice of baptizing babies. They said you can't do that. They, they hated the practice of infant baptism. And so Anna means again. They baptized again those who were baptized as babies. But what is really interesting is that the Anabaptist movement spawned several other churches to include the Baptist, the Amish, the Mennonites, and the Brethren in Christ. And as religious freedom expanded, denominationalism continued to grow and to multiply into the dozens of factions that you can see here on the timeline. And this laid the foundation for a multitude of denominations that exist in the present day. Some of these churches began with a noble desire to break free from some of the clearly unscriptural practices. Others began with less noble reasons. In fact, if you notice on the chart here, the Church of England in 1534, this church started as a result of King Henry VIII and his desire to have his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled. When the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't grant that, they said, no, we're not going to allow you to divorce her. The result was, he said, I'll start my own church. And he separated and he formed the Church of England. Now, what's the point? The point is, he didn't even have a, a good or a noble motive. But our point is, this chart, this timeline, represents a small fraction of the churches that exist in the world today. Some began with good motives, others began with bad motives, but all of them were started by men. If you go back to the top of the chart, you will see the green line that represents the church that was started by Jesus Christ. This is the church that began in AD 33 in Jerusalem. This is the church 
of Christ, the one that you read about in the pages of the New Testament. And from history, you can see that all other churches are man-made denominations. Now, hopefully now you can see why there are so many churches. But here's the message that we need to take to heart. Since Jesus condemns division, we need to be a part of that one church that Jesus established, the one that was bought with His blood, not one of these man-made churches that came along later in history. Now, here is the important question. What does all of this mean for us today? Does this mean that denominations are wrong? Dear friend, I want to be kind, but I want to be clear. The answer would have to be, it would mean that. It would have to mean that all denominations are wrong. All churches other than the one built by Jesus Christ exist without New Testament authority or example. Now, does that mean that good-intentioned, morally upright people in these denominations are going to be lost? Let's let the Lord answer this question. I want you to listen to the words of Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Jesus says, this is a scene from the Day of Judgment. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Dear friend, observe with me that Jesus says that on the day of judgment, there are going to be good people, people who have been teachers, people who claim to hold to the name of Jesus, but people who will be lost because they haven't done the will of the Father. The point is, simply having good intentions is not enough. Simply having my heart right is not enough. You know, I actually have to follow the New Testament pattern. I want you to listen again to the words of Acts 2.47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Friend, all of the saved people are in the church, the one that was built by Jesus Christ the same one that existed in Acts chapter 2, the same one that you read about throughout the New Testament, the one that existed prior to all of the denominations of man. The question that we want answered today is, how do I become a part of that church, the one wherein is salvation? How do I become a part of the one church of the Bible? And the answer is, I do it the same way that they did it, in the Bible, in the New Testament, I have to obey the gospel. Sometimes people in the religious world will tell you that there's nothing that you have to obey. They will say you only have to believe. But I want you to listen to the words of 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. The Bible says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says there will be rest for those who are faithful Christians, but that those who do not obey God, there's going to be vengeance and there's going to be flaming fire. What does that mean? We have to obey God. Now, Obeying the gospel can be summed up in five short words. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Now, let's expand on this just a little bit. First, a man must hear the gospel. He must hear that because of his sins, he has transgressed the will of God, and he is therefore destined to die eternally in hell. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. He also must hear that Jesus Christ came as God in the flesh to pay the penalty for his sins so that he doesn't have to go to hell. He must hear that salvation is found in Christ Jesus. 
Romans 10 and verse 14 indicates that if a person doesn't hear the message of the gospel, he has no hope. And so, upon hearing it, he then must believe it. Now, what does that entail? Well, he must believe what he has heard. He must believe and understand that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. John 8, 24, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. He must understand that Jesus is deity. John 1 and verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He must believe also in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. How that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8 and that He arose, defeating death, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and 55. Romans 10 and verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And it's crucial that a person believe and understand the body of Christ, which is the one church of Christ, the church of the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.10 says that salvation is... In Christ, he must hear, he must believe, he must then repent. What does that mean? Repentance is a change of mind brought about by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Again, repentance is a change of mind brought about by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. Hear, believe, repent, then he must confess. What kind of confession are we talking about? Romans 10 and verse 10 tells us, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Acts chapter 8, as Philip was teaching the gospel to the Ethiopian, he said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said to the Ethiopian, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. That's the confession that we're talking about. That is the things that he has heard and the things that he has believed. He is simply confessing, I've heard it and I believe it. And he summarizes all that by saying, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Finally, involved in obeying the gospel, a person must be baptized. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Baptism as practiced by first century Christians was total immersion. In fact, that's the meaning of baptism. It is the point at which a person contacts the saving blood of Jesus. It's the point at which he has obeyed the gospel. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Once you do these things, Acts 2.47 says, the Lord will add you to the church. Friends, the church of Christ still exists today just as it did in the first century. You know, some people misunderstand the church of Christ. They think that it's just another denomination alongside a long string of denominations. But I can assure you that the church of Christ has no earthly head. It has no legal hierarchy. It wasn't started by any man. It doesn't follow any man-made creeds or practices. The church of Christ simply follows the New Testament pattern found in the Bible. We meet on the first day of the week to take communion. We sing a cappella the way the church did in the first century. We pray. We study the Bible together. We hear preaching together. We give financially according to how God has blessed us. Christ is our only head. The Church of Christ is composed of elders and deacons, evangelists, and members, just as it was several thousand years ago. 
We abide only in the doctrine of Christ. We cast away all man-made doctrines and creeds, and we as Christians only are God's people. Friends, we're not advocating that anyone leave his denomination and join our denomination. We're advocating that men leave all denominations and simply be a part of the one church belonging to Christ, the one that existed hundreds of years before the churches of today, the one church that we read about in the Bible.